We begin by acknowledging we are standing on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Several years ago, uh, here on the Bedford Barrens, petroglyphics were discovered of the indigenous people. And Bedford was a meeting place for those people. They uh, gathered in Bedford, and we have a debt of gratitude to, that we owe them for being wonderful stewards of the land, caretakers of our waterways, and animals. And we give thanks this day for the recently renaming of a park in Halifax to the, it was done out this week actually, and they renamed a park to Peace and Friendship Park. As we will continue to work towards right relationships and uh, peace and reconciliation with our indigenous, indigenous brothers and sisters. Good morning, BUC. My name is Reverend Gloria Churchill, and I've been honored to be your presider for the month of June. This is my last Sunday, and I thank you for the privilege of being so. We're delighted to have you tune in with us this morning and worship from the sanctuary. But next week, next Sunday, July the 4th, we're even more thrilled to have you come to in-person worship. And uh, some of the COVID restrictions are still going to be in place, of course. You have to wear your mask and social distance and all of that, sanitize. You also have to sign in, but you do not have to register, pre-register. Uh, you just need to come as you are and uh, be here, and our host team will be here to welcome you and guide you along as we enter the church through our new doors. We have new doors. Now, you leave through the new doors. You enter through the side doors by the office. I forgot to say that. On behalf of the fundraising team, uh, last Saturday was a wonderful event, our lobster fundraiser. Thank you to all who volunteered and to, to help, and to all of you who purchased lobsters. It was a great event, and we don't have the final tally yet, but we're expecting to have raised approximately $2,000. And one other announcement to come to your attention is from our fundraising committee. We are Sally, Sophie, and Suzette Strawberry. And we're here to say, strawberries have to ripen in the certain way when they are black with seeds and have that most sunshine glow. Strawberries are the best and I'm the best, you know, when you can eat them in a salad. You can make them into jam any way you want to eat them. It's impossible to beat them. Strawberries like the opportunity to make you and your friends happy. So get your orders in now and help your church be more snappy. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Olay! Yes! And the prices are and when? Get your orders in BUC Fundraising Team at gmail.com. The orders are being taken from now to July 8th. Delivery date is July 10th, 1 to 3 in the lower parking lot. $40 a flat, 8 boxes. Get those orders coming in. And oh. they'll be sweet, just like us. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> As we light our Christ candle today, we remember and we say with all sincerity that God is here all the time. All the time, God is here. And as we are an inclusive church, a church that welcomes all, we say with hearts full of what love and welcome. All are welcome. All the time. All are welcome. Let's join our hearts and spirits in worship today and focus on the good things of life. Yeah. <laughs> 
Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living as you Thanksgiving. Every day is a day of thanksgiving. God, you've been so good to me. Every day you're blessing me. Every day is a day of thanksgiving. I will glorify you, oh my God. Today you keep blessing me, blessing me blessing me you've opened the door that i might see you're blessing me you keep blessing me blessing me oh blessing me and i will glorify you oh my god today every day is a day of thanksgiving god you've been so good to me Every day you're blessing me, every day is a day of thanksgiving. I will glorify you, oh my God, today. I will glorify you, oh my God, Love is the touch of intangible joy. Love is the touch of intangible joy. Love is the force that no fear can destroy. Love is the goodness we gladly applaud. 
The Christian community, especially here in America, but to some degree we, we've imported this all around the world, we, we've tended to divide um, into two groups. Conservatives have tended to emphasize the personal dimensions of faith, and liberals have tended to emphasize the ethical and public and social dimension of faith. The results have not been good. When you have people who emphasize a public and ethical social vision of faith, but it isn't supported by a deep spiritual vitality, it can degenerate into kind of an ideology, sometimes into an institutionalism. Sometimes it doesn't sound that different than a political party and ideology. On the other hand, when people try to create a personal spirituality, that doesn't address the realities of God's world that God loves so much, uh, that, that's going to be a deformed and distorted spirituality. It's going to end up very often becoming a kind of tribal religion that exists for the benefits of one group over others or even of certain kinds of powerful pastors and leaders who make a profit uh, over, uh, over the people that they service uh, spiritually. That, that's why I think as we move forward, we need what I sometimes like to call Pentecostalism 2.0. If the Pentecostalism of the last 100 years was about rediscovering the experience of the Holy Spirit, especially what the Holy Spirit can do at the end of long meetings with a lot of loud preaching and motivational music, I'd like to discover in the next 100 years what the Holy Spirit can do, not just in a church service, but in our whole lives. And not just relating to religious things, but what would happen if school teachers said, I want to teach my students math and geography and history with the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through me, with the energy and joy of the Spirit working through me. What would happen if doctors saw their medical work as as spiritual work. What would happen if engineers said, you know, I really shouldn't be involved in that building project because that's building something that's actually harmful for God's creatures and God's world and some of God's people. Um, what would happen if we saw that the personal dimensions of being connected to the Spirit internally, letting our own hearts and lives and minds be filled and transformed by the Spirit, that's the preparation to make activists who go into the world and make a difference in relation to poverty and human conflict and, and environmental destruction and an unsustainable economy. What would happen if we could combine the passion of personal vibrant spirituality with a responsible and wise and, and engaged 
faith lived out in public life. So to me, one of the great opportunities and challenges as we move forward is to discover that the Holy Spirit is not a private spirit and is not a religious spirit, but is the spirit that fills and flows through and is manifested in all creation, in the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, that the spirit of the creator that shows in all of creation is inviting us into this beautiful vitality and aliveness in the spirit, new life in God's spirit, being connected to God and connected to all of God's creation. Oh my goodness, it's a beautiful vision. And it's what I think more and more of us are seeking as we walk the road of faith. Even if I can speak in all the tongues of the earth and those of the angels too, but do not have love, I am just a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have a gift of prophecy such that I can comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge. Or I have faith great enough to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything I own to feed those poorer than I, then hand over my body to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not jealous, it does not put on airs. And it is not snobbish, it is never rude or self-seeking. Not prone to anger, nor does it brood over injuries. Love doesn't rejoice in what is wrong, but rejoices in the truth. There is no limit to love's forbearance, to its trust, its hope, its power to endure. Love never fails. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. See it all as clearly as God sees us. Knowing God directly, just as God knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do that to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly. And the best of these three is love. May the spirit bless the wisdom of this work. And all the people said, Amen. 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 Set your seal upon my heart. 
Friends, we're singing true this morning. We, God takes us as we are, even if we've got to shake off some rust from uh, not being in person for a while. I swear that Zoom call worked perfect when we pre-recorded and played it back. But there are little, little gremlins that happen on Sunday morning, and it's great to have them back with us too. Friends, my name is Reverend Matthew Fillier, and I'm your preacher for today. And I'm going to bring you a question inspired by last week's sermon. It's a bit of a wondering Thomas question. And it, it's from life coach Laura Whitworth. And she asks, I wonder what it would be like if we could imagine a world where people are willing to truly listen to the words and also everything behind the words, right? What would our life be like if we could do that? If you put it another way, you might say, imagine if we could listen for the word behind the the words, the word of God, the word of the Spirit. What would it be like if we could see the image of God in everyone in our relationships with each other? What kind of world would that be? Well, I think it'd be a lot like the kingdom of God that Jesus proclaimed, right? So what gives? If it's just a matter of listening a little more, we got two of these and one of these, let's just do more listening. It's not quite that simple though, is it? You know, human beings were hardwired, hardwired biologically to do everything we can to avoid chaos. We really do enjoy the status quo if that status quo gives us security and privilege and certainty. I mean, that's how you survive in the natural world. So anything that comes along that threatens to destabilize uh, that security, leading to uncertainty and unpredictability, anything that's going to tip over or upset that proverbial apple cart, well, we respond in fear to that. We want none of it, right? You know, we've been talking about, for the last few weeks, the reality of chaos in our universe that science will tell you again and again is not unusual. It's simply part of the known universe. It's going to erupt. The question is how we respond to it. And you know, with chaos, without it, I would say, there's no lasting transformation, let alone resurrection. And the scriptures really bear witness to this. I mean, without the chaos of Good Friday, how can new life emerge on Easter Sunday? So I want to tell you a wisdom story that kind of demonstrates this, why we avoid curiosity for fear of insecurity and change, right? Very few times do we ever like the kind of change that turns our life upside down and causes us to look at everything and everyone, including ourselves, differently, right? So here's the story. So there's this old man who likes to sit outside the gate of his village, and there's an intersection there, a crossroads. So there's always travelers coming and going. This one day a traveler comes, sees the old man and says, oh, excuse me, I've been on a long journey, and I'm just wondering, what are the people like in your village? Well, the old man perks up at this and says, oh, you look very weary from that long journey. Tell me, where are you from? The traveler's a little surprised by the question and says, well, I'm from my Chester. Oh, says the old man, and what are the people like in my Chester? And the traveler says, oh, they're the worst. I mean, they'd stab you in the back in a heartbeat. I mean, if you need anything, you are on your own. If you're not part of a very particular clique in my Chester, it's like no one even knows that you exist. I was so alone living in my Chester. And the old man nodded his head and said, you'll find the people in my village are just like the people from my Chester. And the traveler was brokenhearted and just despondent looking down at the ground and slowly shuffled off down that road. Some time passed. Along comes another traveler. The traveler sees the old man, the second traveler, and says, Oh, excuse me, I've been on this long journey, and uh, can you tell me what are the people like in your village? The old man straightens up again and says, Oh, you do look very weary from your journey. Uh, tell me, where are you from? And the second traveler says, I'm from my Chester. And the old man says, my Chester, really? And what are the people like in my Chester? And the second traveler says, oh, they are the best neighbors you could ever ask for. You know, it, when I was hungry, they gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, they gave me something to drink. If I ever needed anything, they give you the clothes off their back. You were never alone in my Chester. The old man said, hmm. You'll find the people in my village are just like 
the people from Leicester, right? Now, I know that story causes us to smirk a little bit, right? But actually, it leads to a really unhelpful moral worldview, right? This is the story that kind of inspires this saying that we have that says, like, if you go looking for bad apples, you're going to find bad apples. And if you go looking for good apples, you will find good apples. So everybody, just go looking for good apples and everything will be fine. It doesn't work that way, though. I mean, that silences people rather than listens to their truth. It actually buries the truth and ensures we just keep our relationships on the surface. It ensures that whatever your apples and your cart are like, it's never going to change. If you had a painful experience and that causes you to see the world in a painful way, well, that's all you're ever going to do is see pain. And if you had a positive experience and you see things in a good way and an exciting way, that's all you're ever going to see. You know, in this story, it's fascinating. No one is transformed. All the relationships stay exactly the same. There is no resurrection here. This is not a story born of Jesus. You know, I wonder what it would be like if I called Elder Joe Michael from Sabinagate First Nation, and upon hearing that we've almost got a thousand children buried in unmarked graves at residential school, I didn't call Joe and led the conversation with, you know, well, I'm a good person, and I'm not responsible for what other people did way back when. Uh, we're, we're all good now, Joe. Everything's great. Like, why don't you come on over, and let's just focus on the good things. What if instead of worrying about me and how I feel and what that says about me, I simply asked, hey, Joe, I heard the news. How are you? How's your community? Very different conversation. What if on hearing the news about what happened to Muslims in Alberta and let alone London, Ontario, instead of reacting out of, oh, that's those big city people, that's the bad apples, those upper Canadians and the rest of the bunch. But here in the Maritimes, we know all our neighbors, we're all good, everything's good about us, we know each other, we look after each other. That stuff doesn't happen here. What if instead of getting wrapped up in all of that, I simply called our friends at Al Rasul and said, I heard the news. How are you doing? How's your community feeling right now? What's it like to be a Muslim Canadian living in the Maritimes? I'm curious. You know, Paul, he will go on to say things like, you know, we will all bury things deep, but everything that's buried deep will eventually be seen in the light. The only question is, the deeper you bury it, the harder it will be to look at. I mean, Imagine what would happen if the old man was curious enough to listen for the word behind the words of that first traveler. What if he said, I see that you're weary from that journey and I hear you're wounded, right? Rather, something happened in my Chester that was so hard for you. Why don't you come over to my house where all are welcome all the time and from anywhere in the world and I'll open my heart and my ear. We'll share a cup of tea together. You tell me your story and I'll tell you mine. What if instead of judging the traveler, what if he listened to the word behind the words? He might have heard Jesus of Nazareth speaking, saying, I didn't come for those who are well, but for those who are wounded. And imagine if that traveler was curious enough to accept the invitation to that house. Imagine the resurrection that could be possible for both of them if they could just listen to the word behind their words. What kind of world would that be? You know, I had a, a wise leader who's uh, an inspiration to me. I'm paraphrasing something she said, but she said, the root of all evil is indirect communication, <laughs> Right? When we can't be vulnerable with each other, when we can't trust each other, when we can't be authentically who we are, then we can't own our truth and nor can our neighbor claim theirs. And that's when we start to play games. That's when assumptions creep in and fracture our love uh, into something far less than what Paul is dreaming about today. You know, in some ways, I wonder if the cause of so much human suffering isn't a profound lack of curiosity about one another. 
You know, Paul is writing to people whose lives have been turned inside out by chaos. And he proclaims that we need a love that rejoices in the truth. This love persists through the chaos, right? It persists through the chaos, and it blends all of that energy to the transformation of new life. He reminds us that it's easy in the midst of uncertainty and fear to get stuck in a kind of love that rejoices in wrongdoing, he says. This kind of love that's about being right and condemning others as wrong. When we root ourselves in that love of wrongdoing, we're rooted in competition and judgment and rivalry. We're in the fear of someone using our truth against us to score points. Like you can't lose any face in this kind of love. So your neighbor is your opponent and they've always got to lose. You've always got to win. It's about being right this kind of love. The cost of this love is too high. If you look at human history, it's cost us everything. It's worth nothing. It's just a clanging cymbal or noisy gong. Let me give you an example of what this love is like, this love that seeks wrongdoing. And no surprise, we're going to see it in politics. You know, recently the Senate was debating Bill C-15, and Senator Mar Mary Jane McCallum, who's a residential school survivor and a Cree woman, she spoke to the bill clutching a handful of eagle feathers. Now, Bill C-15 is about uh, the UN Declaration of Rights for Indigenous People and enshrining it in Canadian law. And if you don't know what eagle feathers signify for indigenous people, well, like the over 700 acts of reconciliation that we've undertaken so far through our Facebook invitation, I invite you to Google it. Better yet, go back, watch the service where Elder Joe Michael actually presented us with our talking sticks and talked about what the eagle feather represents. Let's educate ourselves. So she was speaking to this. And Senator Don Platt asked for the speaker to rule on whether the feathers are a prop for good reason, props aren't allowed in the Senate because in that environment, it engenders an unfair advantage. It allows your opponent to score some points that you don't have the same opportunity to score. So they might win the vote, and that means that your team loses. Now, we could talk about what's wrong with how we do government all day long in that one, but that's a love that's rejoicing in wrongdoing, pointing to the rules and saying, you have to lose because you're not following the rules. Now, McCallum responded with refusing to bury her truth. She lifted the feathers into the light, and she said, This is who I am. This is what was taken away from me, and I will not give it up again. I understand the rules, and I do understand there needs to be change, and that change will come. The fog will clear. The sun will shine. Yes, Senator, a change is going to come. And the change will come because in the chaos, people of the way embrace the faith of the risen one and persist with a love that rejoices in the truth that enables us to listen for the word behind the words. Imagine how that conversation could have gone. Instead of trying to point at rules and getting ahead of each other, the senator had simply reached out to say, why are you holding the eagle feathers? Can you tell us what that means for you? Would have been a different conversation. So what does this love that rejoices in the truth look like? How do we activate it in our lives? Well, I'll give you a basic example. I showed up with these wonderful human beings here for a meeting uh, earlier this week in person. How exciting. Never seen people excited for a church meeting like that. And as I rolled in the lot, there were all these cars and I thought, oh my goodness, I have missed something. I'm going to be fired. And I hear this bubbling up of laughter and joy and noise of all kinds. And I look over in the crossing, which is at the front of BUC, and here's the fellowship unit of the United Church Women. And they got their feet up in their long chairs. They've got glasses with the funky uh, umbrellas. They've got bubbles that they're blowing. They've got a communion table overloaded with food and a cake that says, finally, we're back together again. And I just stood there and let that love just radiate. You could feel the energy from that group of women. And it was incredible. And they saw me and they said, hey, Matt. And I said, hey, everybody, I, I got a meeting. 
And what they could have said was, okay, go to your meeting. But they didn't. They didn't send me down the road. Instead, they said, <laughs> I was like, I got a meeting. And they said, who cares? Right? <laughs> come and be with us. Come and eat. Come and drink. Let's come and get to know one another again after being away from each other from so long. How beautiful is that? They modeled that curious love that Paul is on about, that Jesus is on about. That's what brings new life. Imagine if we took that orientation and we brought it to everybody in our community, whether they're here in person or they don't live in the vicinity to be able to be in person. Imagine if we brought it to everyone in Bedford, everyone in our wider community, everybody in the world. What kind of life would it be? You know, chaos isn't going anywhere. That energy is fundamental to the universe we live in. And there's good news. That in the midst of it, hope, faith, and love abide these three. And the greatest of these will always be love. Not a love that's going to rejoice in wrongdoing, but a love that rejoices in the truth. So friends, let's be curious enough to seek that love. May the fog clear and the sun shine. Friends, may the Spirit in me honor the Spirit in you. And all the people said, Amen. Once again, we come with thankful hearts, open to the spirit of giving. You will see on the screen uh, ways in which you can gift BUC, especially during the summer. 
when attendance may be a bit low with people away at their cottages and uh, traveling around, especially with restrictions lifted a little bit now. We hope you're out and enjoying yourselves. But uh, with the PER, pre-authorized remittance, that's one way that you may keep up your commitment to our church. And uh, there's the way to do that would be to contact the church office and sign up for that. And that also helps our church to um, be more accurate with their budgeting and help us to use our uh, gifts to further the mission of our work in the world and in our community. All of your gifts of time, talent, and money are greatly appreciated. Now may these gifts, so freely given, be blessed that they may be a blessing to others in our church, in our community, and indeed in our world. Amen. Good morning, BUC. It is great to be with you here this morning virtually, and I am thrilled to introduce to you our three summer students who will be working with BUC this summer. We have three life workers, and life stands for living in faith everywhere, and these three students will be doing just that. They will be enriching our community with their gifts and their skills and their talents, and let me tell you, they have a lot of gifts and talents to share with us, and we have a lot to learn from them. But you can meet them here and get to see that for yourself. And I'd love to introduce Al Welsh, our Life Worker Supervisor, and they will share more about them and what they're looking forward to for this summer. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Al Welsh, as Paige said, and I'm the Life Worker Supervisor here at BUC this summer. Uh, I've been a part of the BUC community since I was born, so 22 years. Um, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to working here at BUC this summer, and I'm most looking forward to getting to work with the children of our faith community and getting to learn and grow with and from them. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Nathan. I've been in this church for about 13, 14 years. And what I'm most looking forward to this summer is um, working at the church that I grew up in, because I think that's really, really cool. And I'm so thankful for all the opportunities that I have. Hi, my name is Kayla, and I've been a part of BUC for five years now, working in the nursery. Uh, the thing I look forward to most for this opportunity is to be able to work with the children of BUC, as I haven't been able to because of COVID, so I'm super excited. We also wanted to share with you a couple of exciting things, one being that we now officially have an Instagram account, and you can find us on Instagram at Bedford United Church. And if you'd like to follow along with the Life Workers Adventures and Journey and Work this summer, we encourage you to like and follow us along on Instagram. We also wanted to remind you that we had our first BUC Day Camp happening July 5th to 9th, and the theme of that camp is the promise of the rainbow, and each day we'll be exploring different colors of the pride flag and celebrating God's never-ending love and promise uh, of love for all of us. If you'd like to register for that camp, we still have just a couple of spots left, so we encourage you to register early if you can, and you can reach out to, uh, to me to receive that link to register. Uh, Kayla, Nathan, and myself will now be leading us in the community prayer, so pray however you would like to. Amazing God, we pray for our global community and the children of God around the world. We lift up our prayers for the end of gun violence and hate crimes against all marginalized communities, including the ongoing discrimination and hostility against the LGBTQ community. We pray for people who do not have access to health care and vaccines. May we work to fight the injustice that has existed and continues to exist across our planet. We pray for our country and the injustices imposed by ourselves and our ancestors, promising to fight for all of those who have been wronged. We pray for those impacted by the residential school system and the impact it continues to have on families as we learn more about these atrocities. We pray for the people who call Trinity Bellwood Park home, who have had their homes, belongings, and security ripped away from them this week. May we remember to put the humanity in all of us first and hold those responsible for these actions accountable. We pray that our community experiences a safe and cautious reopening, and that the people and businesses who have been struggling are able to find solid ground again. We pray for the family of Kai Matthews as they learn to navigate the world with a missing piece of themselves. Uh, we hope that our healthcare system learns from this and many other missteps to treat all people with respect and dignity. 
Uh, we pray for our BUC community and all those who are sick, hurt, and suffering. May they know and remember that they are surrounded by the love of God in our church family. God, hear our prayers to, for the world. God, we lift up to you our prayers of celebration and gratitude. May everyone experience safety in celebrating themselves and remembering those who have been lost. We lift up Pride Month. We lift up National Indigenous Peoples History Month. We lift up Juneteenth. We give thanks for those who fight for themselves and others through education and activism. May their cries be heard and their needs met. We celebrate the good news that conversion therapy has been banned in Canada. We pray that everyone is able to live their lives how they are being called to. We celebrate that many people will be able to reconnect with family and friends while holding in our hearts those who do not yet have this opportunity. We give thanks that our local United Church camps, Camp Kidston and Sherbrooke Lake Camp, are able to host campers this summer and allow everyone to appreciate your creation and feel your love. We celebrate those who are experiencing changes at this time. Children who are transitioning to summer, grade 12 students who are looking forward to the future, and university graduates who have incredible capabilities to offer the world. God, we lift up the joy and hardship of this time. We give thanks that you are forever beside us, lighting the path and showing us the way forward. May we continue to listen to your call. In your love we pray, amen. If you were in the sanctuary with us this morning, at this point, I would ask you to stand. So at home, you can stand, you know, just to make it official. We're going to sing My Love Colors Outside the Lines. knowing the spirit of the divine and the spirit of life is within us, around us, and between us, and in everyone we encounter this week. Just like the rising smoke reminds us of that truth. Namaste. The spirit in me, born of love, honors the spirit in you. Have a great week. Like a rock, like a rock, God is under our feet. Like the starry night sky, God is over our head. Like the sun on the horizon, God is ever before. Like the river runs to 
ocean, our home is in God evermore. Like a rock, like a rock, God is under our feet. Like the starry night sky, God is over our head. Like the sun on the horizon, God is ever before. Like the river runs to ocean, our home is in God. 